All right. Oh, that's that's the wrong screen. I think we're recording, folks. All right. Hey, uh, welcome everybody. We got a packed house today, uh, unlike last week. Uh, let's bow our heads, dear Heavenly Father. Thank you for anointing this messenger with this message today. Let the seed fall on good ground. Open up the hearts and the minds of the people to accept this tough message, the reality of the world that we live in. Let your word not return unto thee void, but let it accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing where you sent it. In your precious Son's name we pray. All right, guys. The conversation today is with feigned words. Anybody know what feigned means? Invented. Devised. Imagined. It's a big word right here. Assumed. 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 All right, so with feigned words, we're, we'll, we'll get into that in a little while. Now listen, folks. What I'm going to have to do for the next three or four weeks is walk a tight line and how much information I share with everybody. I'm going to leave uh, a few loose ends open. Uh, I'm going to expect people to go out there and do the research themselves. I'm going to leave some links in the, uh, the show notes. And I, and, I, and I have to do this for uh, slight protection of myself as I come towards the end of my process, my processes of removing myself from the public. <laughs> Today, I'm going to prove to you beyond a shadow of a doubt that uh, what we are operating is under is military rule and it, it is to enlighten you to the fact that there's two separate entities you assume yourself to be this fiction and you are not all right so discussion yesterday was voting day here in louisiana and while most men and women still believe their votes matter the truth as always isn't what most believe it to be and why is that well, folks, we've been voting for 100 years. It just keeps getting worse. At what time are you going to give your 110% and vote hard enough to make a change? They're not going to. They're not. Not going to happen. It's not going to happen. You can, well, you can, you can vote as much as you want. The system's not going to change because what? The system's already set. They'll just plug and play members into this system the fact of the matter is the system is designed to operate the way it's operating. Which one of these presidents, which one of these congressmen, which one of these, of these fellas are going to come in here and stop the homosexuality, stop the transgender, stop the uh, religion of Judaism running our country? Who is going to stop it? None of them. <coughs> it's not until you, the in individual living man, uh, come to the realization of who and what you are will things change and it starts one person at a time or let me get that uh, word out of my vocabulary one man or woman at a time here's a quote by uh, Rutherford B. Hayes diary and letters of Rutherford Birchford Hayes 19th president of the United States the real difficulty is with the vast wealth and power in the hands of the few and the unscrupulous who represent or control capital Hundreds of laws of Congress and the state legislators, le legislatures are in the interest of these men and against the interest of working men. These need to be exposed and repealed. All laws on corporations, on taxation, on trust, wills, dissent, and the like need examination and extensive change. This is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. No longer. When did he write this? 1888. It is a government of what? Corporations, by corporations, and for corporations. We're going to discuss this. I'm not going to give all the details because, of course, I can't. Uh, in one little study group, I'm going to try to get through this. Southern states forced at gunpoint to reconvene. How many people believe here that the Civil War was about slavery? Anybody? How many of y'all believe the Civil War was about slavery? It wasn't. The fact of the matter of the Civil War uh, was about the southern states leaving Congress and stating that they were not going to allow their uh, wages to be taxed anymore. What happened? What happened at that point? Abraham Lincoln bypassed Congress, stipulated the executive order, and created war. What was that war? He reconvened Congress at gunpoint. That's a fact. And we'll read one of Abraham Lincoln's quotes next. Ordered on the second, 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 uh, 22nd day of February 1862, uh, 
be the day for a general movement of the land and naval forces of the United States against the insurgent forces. That especially the army at and about Fortress Monroe, the Army of the Potomac, the Army of West Virginia, the Army near Munderful, Kentucky, the Armor and Army Army and Flotilla at Cairo, and a naval force in the Gulf of Mexico be ready to move on that day. That all other forces, both land and naval, with their respective commanders, obey existing orders for the time and be ready to obey, obey additional orders when duly given. That the heads of departments, and especially the secretaries of war and of the Navy, with all their subordinates and the uh, uh, general-in-chief, with all other commanders and subordinates of land and naval forces, will severally be held to their strict and full responsibilities for prompt execution of this order. What happened here, folks? Bypass what? What's the delegation of powers? What is the true purpose? What what supposedly was the true purpose of the Constitution? Separation of powers. Congress only had the authority to what? Wage war. The judicial branch, they were all separated, right? That's the balance of power, supposed to be. What happened here on uh, January 27th, 1862 was a usurpation of, of, of the powers, uh, balance of powers. War was waged. On who? Americans. Matter of fact, bloodiest war ever fought. Hmm. All right. Abraham Lincoln, this direct quote from Abraham Lincoln, my paramount ab object in this struggle is to save the Union, it is not either to save or to destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could slay, uh, save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing, freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. What I do about slavery and the colored race, I do because I believe it helps to save the Union. And what I forbear, I forbear because I do not believe it would help to save the Union. Oh, really? Well, what's a Union? That's a pretty big word right there, right? Well, let's define the term Union. A league, a federation, an unincorporated association of per persons for a common purpose as a trade or labor union. Huh. That's kind of funny. I thought we were a constitutional republic. Joinder. We're going to learn about this word today. Joinder. A joining or coupling together. Uniting two or more constituents or elements into one. Uniting with another person in, a, in some legal step or proceeding. A what? A union. A concurrence. Presumptio fortia. A strong presumption. No ma'am. A presumption of fact entitled to great weight, one which determines the tribunal and its belief in an alleged fact, without, however, excluding the belief of the possibility of it being otherwise. The effect of which is to shift the burden of producing evidence to the opposite party. And if this proof not be not made, the presumption is held for truth. What, what just got said there? The courts run on the presumption that you know who you are. And when you don't prove that you are not, they presume <laughs> you to be whatever you claim to be. Huh. That's kind of funny. Because this joinder and this presumptio, we're gonna we're gonna see that these go go hand in hand. What's going on back there? Is everybody going crazy today? Alright, let's start our scriptures. So where did I get with feigned words? Directly out of your Bible. 2 Peter 2 2. And many shall follow their pernicious, pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be uh, evil spoken of. And through covetousness. What's coveting? It's like uh, kind of like forming a pact. No, coveting is to want material goods. Coveting your neighbor's land. Look, this whole system's designed on this. Look, I watched, I watched a little bit of a football game last night, and I paid attention to the commercials because it's the first time I've watched uh, TV in quite some time. Every commercial is aimed at what? The lust and eyes of the flesh. They've got mirrors now. 
I seen, seen a commercial for a mirror last night where people work out in front of this, this scrying mirror. They're jogging and the mirror is talking to them. Um, um, I lost my train of thought. Um, you've got mirrors inside your bathrooms. Now was another one. You've got mirrors inside your bathrooms. Telling uh, you could tell the mirror to take my profile uh, shot for Facebook today. It's a self-loving. Uh, this is Satanism, by the way. And if it's not that, it's cars. What? You'll see that everything is focused on the material world, the outside world. That's going to make you happy. So you're coveting. Shall they with feigned words? Here's the next most most important part. Make merchandise out of who? Out of you. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words, imagined words, assumptions, invented words. That's what feigned means. Make merchandise out of you. Who's the tax? Who, who, who else in here pays taxes? They've made merchandise out of you. You're a slave, Neo. Huh? Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. What a scripture, folks. How many times have you read this and not taken in the beauty of just how true this verse is? How many times do you r rush through reading something and not truly recognize or understand what you just read? Hey, man, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue to say this to folks who read the Bible and decide to just race through it. And not truly understand the words that you're that you're looking at. That's a that's a huge scripture by Peter. Because it's the reality of the world that we live in today. Who can make war with the beast? <coughs> the merchants of the earth. Huh? Everything's about commerce, folks. We're gonna we're gonna continue to expound on this thought process as we go. How come and I'm going to say this over and over again until men and women. I don't want to hear it's just that's just the way things are. I don't want to hear these pre-programmed responses. What's another one I got up here? If you don't vote, you don't. You have nothing to complain about. These men and these that, uh, these drones that are programmed with this response, they regurgitate exactly what they heard from the TV. They're nothing but zombies. Never once have they had their own thought. Not one, not one original thought. Assume to pretend, to undertake, engage, promise, to take on, that is to become bound as another is bound, or put oneself in the place of another. That's called representation. You can only be present. You cannot represent something. Do you understand that? How many used are there? There's only one you. So how can you be represented? In place of another as to an obligation or liability. Obligations and liabilities, right? That's that consenting. Imagine the vain thing. Let's go through a couple scriptures right here. I still see a, a, a bunch of newcomers to the, the channel that don't quite uh, recognize how, the importance of words yet. I am Yahuwah, which had brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Hey man, you can't get you you can't get any clearer than that. I brought you out of the house of bondage, and what do we want to do? We want to go back in. Commandment two Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. What's a graven image? a dead image. It's not alive. It's not real. It's in the land of fiction. Or any likeness of anything that is in 
heaven above or that is in the earth beneath? Well, let me ask you this, folks. You walk around with images in your pockets all the time. What did, what did uh, Yahuwah say? This is the most important thing that we'll talk about today. Modern Christianity is lawless to the point of it destroying itself. There's a reason why most churches you go to say the law is done away with. They don't know the freedom that comes from these laws. And that's why they're 501c3 corporations. They've made their, they've made their God mammon. Or that is in the water underneath the earth. Thou shalt now not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. That's pretty important right there. So when persecution comes, what are we supposed to do? What, what are we supposed to do? Let's talk about the name that you, you, you think you are. The name can be described as a person, a legal person, a legal personality, an artificial person, a legal fiction, ends legis, company, trade name, vessel in commerce, transmitting utility, creature of the law, ward of the state, employee of the state, public servant, estate trust, foreign citizen trust, sesquivy uh, estate trust, deceased estate, de decadent, corporation, corpse, franchise, bankrupt, surety, accommodation party, debtor, or debt ledger. Which one of those are you? Who are you really? My name's Brandon Albert. I'm from the uh, Sib of, uh, uh, clan of Sibley. That's who I am. I'm a living man living on uh, Yahuwah's earth. His footstool. And for some reason, the society that I live in has deemed it that in order for me to live here, I've got to, one, get educated from, uh, from five years old to 16 or 24 if you go to college, and then from that point on, I've got to pay that taxes to live on, on something that nobody owns until I'm dead. We have assumed an identity and with it accepted the bonds that come with it. We imagine ourselves as things of the dead. We leave the natural world and yonder. We join. That's what yonder means. We've attached ourselves to something that's not, not real. And we've attached ourselves to the covenant of death. I'm going to have a few more scriptures in here today. We're going to read from Senate Report 93549. Let's go ahead and go to the internet um, and let's do this together. Hey, look, folks, I'm going to put this in the show notes and I ask people to read this thing if you want to. Oh, come on, Brandon. I did it again. All right. This is a, a Senate report from 1973. Let's read this together. We're, going to read, we're just going to read some of it. I'm going to put it in show notes. People go read it yourselves. I'm going to put a few other links in there. The point I'm trying to make today is the reality of our current situation. Since March 9th, 1933, the United States has been in a state of declared national emergency. In fact, there are now in effect four presidentially proclaimed states of national emergency. In addition to the national emergency declared by President Roosevelt in 1933, Truman in 1950, Nixon in 1970 and 1971, these proclamations give force to 470 provisions of federal law. These hundreds of statutes delegate to the president extraordinary powers, ordinarily exercised by the Congress, which affect the lives of American citizens in a host of all-encompassing manners. This vast range of powers taken together confer enough authority to rule the con country without reference to normal constitutional processes. Well, let's, let's break that down. You don't have a constitution, folks. Since 1933, well, actually before that with Abraham Lincoln, but they had to get it to a point to where enough people could sign on for this. Congress, Congress has bypassed, given all, I've told you all this before, what do we operate under? It's called the executive branch, admiralty law, 
international commerce law. That's why everybody has a license. And let's do this real quick. Let's read this together. What's a license? International law. Permission granted by a belligerent. What's belligerent? Anybody know the word belligerent? In contradiction, state to its own subjects or to the subjects of the enemy to carry on trade interdicted by war. The national state of emergency is your state of war. That's why there's always a new war on the horizon. You get one war to the next. What's the war, current war that we're in now? War on terror. Could easily be the war on terror, which is Earth. Let's go read a, a few more sections, and then I'll uh, I'll just put this in the show notes. Let's read this section right here. Now, introduction. How come nobody knows this information? Well, hardly anybody. Because you've lived your whole life in this information. Matter of fact, it's even in the Senate report. A majority of the people of the United States have lived all their lives under an emergency rule. What happens in, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little while. Uh, living under emergency rule, you're under martial law. There's a reason why your policemen have, have, have uh, weapons to kill you. Who gave them that authority? Who? For 40 years, freedoms and governmental procedures guaranteed by the Constitution have in varying degrees been abridged by laws brought into force by states of national emergency. Now, I'm here to tell you right now that a few very uh, uh, smart lawyers that were in on the founding fathers' documents and everything else knew when they put the article clause in there about the national uh, emergency powers, knew exactly what they were going to do. They knew it from that from the very beginning. They knew it. And we'll we'll talk about more of this. I'm gonna put this in the show notes, and you can go read this. This folks, I I, I highly uh, I would tell you that it, it would be uh, very good for you to do that. There's an assumption that you know that we are in wartime with feigned words. Do they make merchandise of you? Invented words. How many times have I showed y'all in here in this study group the correlations between Latin, English, Greek, all these other words, and you have no clue what they mean? Let's uh, take a uh, let's take a quote from Charles E. Hughes, Supreme Court Justice, in 1920. We may well wonder, in view of the precedents now established whether constitutional government as heretofore maintained in this republic could survive another great war, even victoriously waged. How could that happen? Surely if we go out and fight a war and win it, we'd have to end up stronger than the day we started, wouldn't we? Justice Hughes goes on to say, now how is uh, an emergency war powers granted and they stay open for 100 years? That's right. So let me ask this again. This is called logical deduction. If we're under admiralty law, how many of your votes matter? Hmm. The conflict known as the World War had ended as far as military hostilities were concerned, but was yet not officially terminated. Most of the war statutes were still in effect. Many of the emergency organizations were still in operation. We'll find out that Trading with the Enemy Act of 1917 is still in effect today. A matter of fact, most executive orders cite this, this act as their governing power. Now, what we're trying to do today, folks, in 1933, Congressman Beck, speaking from the Cong Congressional Record states, I think of all the damnable heresies that have been, ever been suggested. In connection with the Constitution, the doctrine of emergency is the worst. It means that when Congress declares an emer emergency, there is no what? No Constitution. This means it's death. 
It is the very doctrine that the German Chancellor, and we'll go on about uh, Hitler and, and everything else, Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution of the United States of America, we find the following words. The privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion the public safety may require. So what's the truth, folks? What was supposed to happen in, nor in, in, in how our society really operate? Before you could be arrested, you had to be what? Grand jury. There had to be brought evidence against you for, to, to warrant an arrest. What happens now? You're not innocent till proven guilty. That's why you're locked up. You're guilty till proven what? Innocent. The privilege, the habeas corpus. What's habeas corpus? The great writ of liberty. Latin, you have the body. Means you're the what? The living man or woman. This is the writ which guarantees that the government cannot charge us and hold us with any crime unless they follow the procedure of due process of law. What's Donald Trump famous for saying? Oh, we'll suspend due process for that. That's because it's not in, in effect. People can go crazy all they want, but they won't tell you the truth. We are slaves, Neo, under military rule. Suspended freedom. Find my little controller here. There we go. Trading with the Enemy Act, Section 2 of the Act of March 9, 1933, Exhibit 8, Subdivision B of the Section 5 of the Act of November 6, 1917, as amended, is hereby amended to read as follows. What did they change from the original Act, folks? Anybody? What was the, the important change with the Trading with the Enemy Act? Well, let's read it together. During time of war or during any other period of national emergency declared by the president, the president may, through any agency that he may designate or otherwise investigate, regulate, prohibit under such rules and regulations as he may prescribe by means of what? Licenses. Or otherwise, any transactions in foreign exchange, transfers of credit between or payments by banking institutions as defined by the president, and export hoarding, melting, or earmarkings of gold or silver corn or bullion or currency by any person within the United States or any place subject to the jurisdiction thereof. What did he just do? What did that act really do? You can read it. During war times, you don't have any rights. You fall under commerce law, international commercial law. And every man or woman inside, domiciled, understand this, folks. I, we're going to get to this today where I'm going to prove to you that there's a, there's a difference between a United States citizen and a, and a regular living man or woman. And it's documents from the IRS. All right. Let's read this together. Many, Mr. Speaker, many of us recently received a letter from the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia inviting members of Congress to participate in a ceremonial signing of a Declaration of Interdependence on January 30th in Congress Hall adjacent to Independence Hall in Philadelphia. A number of mem members of Congress have been invited to sign this document, lending their prestige to its theme. But I want, I want the record to show that my strong opposition to this declaration. Now look, there was many times, the James Trophiconis, the, uh, the John Becks, you, this lady right here, Marjorie Holt, there was times when there were really good men and women in Congress and in the Senate. The, the, the Senate report that I'm reading from, from 1973, went in detail about the emergency war powers and why it and how it was affecting the freedoms of li, uh, living men and women. This is another one of those. Here she goes. This is in the congressional records of, of January 19th, 1976. Marjorie Holt. It calls for the surrender of our national sovereignty to international organizations. It declares that our economy should be regulated by international authorities. It proposes that we enter a new world order. You can't, you, you got to be kidding me that she said that in Congress. 
that would redistribute the wealth created by the American people and what's happened? 1% holds what? Anybody know? 1% of the uh, population holds 99% of the wealth. Are we proud and free people or are we a carcass to be picked by the jackals? And it, go, go ahead and you can read all that. Uh, with feigned words. Commerce is the law. Private international banks, the creditors, and we, the surety for the debt of the United States government. Commerce is the law of the land, and you, the living man or woman, have been tricked into believing that you are a legal entity. This sleight of hand is done with your consent, your signature, your sign that you are acting as a accommodation party, and thus ruled under admiralty maritime jurisdiction, the international law of the uh, sea. And let's do this before I forget. I think I put it in the study, but I can't remember now. All right, this is a... Uh, Cornell uh, Law School, Unifor Uniform Commercial Code, S3401, and what a signature means. A person is not liable on instrument unless... Let's read it. The person signed the instrument. He signed it. The person is represented by an agent or representative. That's a lawyer, Esquire. Okay, understand that. That's what a lawyer and esquire is. He's an agent of the court. He's not your friend. He's not there to help you. Who signed the instrument and the signature is binding on the represented person. Okay. Huh. What's the difference between a signature and an autograph? Anybody? It's a signature is like a contract, whereas an autograph is... Signature is a mark of the dead man in joinder with, it, with his fiction. The persona, the mask. You're taking the place of the dead thing and you sign something. It's right there. Is it right there in your uniform commercial code how important your signature is? All right, let's get back to the study. The sleight of hand is done with your consent, your signature, your sign that you are acting in the place of. We can go on forever with these quotes, folks, but we will actually make today's study a shorter version. We are called to be holy. What's holy mean to you? This means set apart. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. Let's go, uh, let's go look at the W8BEM. I want to look at that real quick. I've got it pulled up somewhere. Let me see where I got it. There it is. All right, folks. This is a pretty important document for those who know how to re uh, read and write. Why? Because every single one of you that go get a job fills out a W-9. The W-9 is for who? United States citizen. Domiciled where? District of Columbia. This is a certificate of foreign status of beneficial owner for United States tax withholding and reporting. This is for individuals. Living men and women. Let's read it. Do not use this form if A. You are not an individual. B. You are a U.S. citizen or other U.S. person, including a resident alien individual. C, you are a beneficial owner claiming that income is uh, effectively connected with the conduct of trade or business within the U.S. Within the U.S., that's that com commerce international law. Here we go. You are a person acting as an intermediary. What's a person acting as an intermediary? That's you, the individual, acting as the dead man. Well, this form tells you that there's two, uh, two types of citizens in the United States. Did you know that? Now, when I think 
think about the things going on. And just the fact that this paperwork's real, this is from IRS.gov. What does this, does this inform you? Doesn't it kind of make you angry while we, we focus on all these other things around us at all times? That your entire life has been a, a, a complete lie? It doesn't bother you in any kind of way that your children were affected by this beast system? That your grandchildren were affected by this beast system? That your ent entire family, your entire culture has been destroyed? Am I therefore your enemy because I tell you the truth? It should affect people a lot more than it does. That's a personal question people got to start asking themselves. How much do they have to, does the system have to take from you before you care? How much? How much is it? How much is too much? How much is enough to stand up against the covenant of death and speak out? How much is enough for you to quit worrying about what you feel about everything and actually start searching out for the truth? That's a question for each to ask. There is, with a, without a doubt, a public, an e pluribus unum out of many one citizen and the private set apart capital C citizen what's the difference between lowercase c and a, uh, uppercase c it's called grammar folks it denotes a proper uh, a proper name it denotes that it's an upper class a citizen of the land born on the land of the land not at what See, you're not riding in a citizenship. You're not riding on any of their ships. Signing something isn't the same as autographing, and I'm gonna go go into more detail in, on this in a in a uh, in a later study. Hey, look, folks, we gotta live here. You're not getting away from this beast system. It's all encompassing. One thing you can do is be holy, set apart. We have to live in this world, but we do not have to take part in the covenant of death and act as the graven image. The creation of the state. Make no mistake about it, folks. The state created an entity. It's called a legal fiction. We are acting in the place of that legal fiction at all times. Surety for the debt, the legal entity, or the persona non grata. I did put it in the study. There it is. James 4 4. <laughs> Friends of the beast system. You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that friendship of the world? Do we not know the kingdoms of the world are what is against Yahuwah's system and Yahusha? Do we not know this? Can we not see this? Let me ask this. Let me let's let's do this. Our reality, what we see before our eyes. Our, our instant surroundings of our family, friends, and loved ones tell us what? Come on, everybody in here. How messed up, how messed up are, is our families? Friendship of the world is enmity with Yahuwah. Whosoever therefore will be a friend a statutory citizen, a taxpayer, a resident, etc. of the world is the enemy of Yahuwah. James 4, 5. Do you think the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? What does that mean? Do you think the scripture saith in vain? How much do you really believe the scriptures is, is, the, is what that's saying? Let's, let's do this little little word word study up here together. Data is in, isn't information. What does that mean? Data is just the gathering of sets of data.
trying to pinpoint algorithms, use data to try to figure out what people are going to do. Information isn't knowledge. Information, you can grab all the information in the world and not be able to have knowledge. Knowledge is the ability to actually recite the information. Knowledge isn't wisdom. Why? Wisdom is the ability to apply that knowledge inside your life. It's why people are ignorant of the scriptures and have no idea the power that's in the, in the words. The power that's in the book. We'd rather go sing glory, glory, hallelujah uh, for two or three hours and not really know how powerful the words are in the book. Isaiah 28, 15, Because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with hell are we at agreement means you struck the hands. What's death? It's the dead things. The graven images. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves with feigned words. Hey folks, the, the serpent is the most subtle beast of the field. What better way to trick the entire world than with the words that you have to use? Sorry about getting a little uh, worked up today. Got a little background noise, so I'm being a little bit now louder. But the point is still the same. At what point? How much do they have to take from us? How much? Are we so docile? Are we so domesticated that even the, 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 the destruction of our youth, the destruction of our children, the destruction of our grandchildren, at what point do we say, hey, that's enough? No, there's not 152 genders. No, the transgender hermaphrodites aren't real. No, 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 no. No, you're not going to tax 50, 58, 60% of my wages. No, I'm not going to be your slave. At what point? At what point? The simplicity of the scriptures. Isaiah 52, 1. Awake, awake. Put on thy strength. What strength? That's wisdom. Knowledge, armed, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. O Zion, put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for henceforth there shall no more come unto thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust, arise and sit down, O Jerusalem, loose thyself from the bands on thy neck. Who's got you in bondage? Well, let's answer this question personally. Who did it? We did it to ourselves. My grandparents, their grandparents. Hey, look, man. The design was to take you off the farm and move you to the city and domesticate you. It worked. The design was to make you dependent on somebody else to always take care of you. No one can cook. No one can build. No one can do anything these days. And yet we'll, talk, we'll run around talking about how, how great we're doing. But nobody is self-sufficient. Isaiah 52.3. And here's the greatest trick you ever pulled. For thus saith Yahuwah, you have sold yourselves for naught. Nothing sold yourselves for nothing. You didn't gain anything. As a matter of fact, he come bearing a gift and he stole everything from you. The, th uh, the adversary came to steal, kill, and destroy. Steal your birthright, kill you off your land, and destroyed your heritage. Nobody has an identity. No culture has an identity. And here's the key part though, folks. And you shall be what? Redeemed without money. Part of that's Yahushua HaMashiach, the Messiah. The other part is what? Hey, look, man, you know one of the saddest things, the emptiest and most void of what I, I see today in today's Christianity and, and most other religions, right? 
They honor him with their lips, but their hearts are far from him. They don't put into action any of his teachings. Not one. And we can do all that other stuff we want to do, but until somebody puts into action the actual words written down, it means nothing. With feigned words, let's read it again, Second uh, Peter 2.1. Man, this scripture just spoke to me this week, man. When I read it on Monday, I knew, I knew what the study was going to be about. This again, how, how many times have I told y'all that I read the scriptures over and over and over again and this one slipped by me I don't know how many times. Maybe 200, 300, 400 times that I've read Second Peter. I don't know. I fall asleep with the scriptures every night on. Oh. No telling how many times I've listened to 2 Peter and did not catch that with feigned words. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom that the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Let me tell you something, folks. You take what you, you just learned in this study today and you go talk to the average everyday bl uh, Joe Blow out on the street, what are they going to call you? Here's the funny thing, though. I get to sit in conversations with my next door neighbors and everybody else tell, telling me stuff like this right here. If you don't vote, you don't have anything to complain about. And what do I do on the inside? I chuckle. You know why? They have no clue how far they deceived. And it doesn't matter what I do to try to talk to them, they can't see it. And through covetousness, Shall they would feign words. Man, they make merchandise of you. Hey folks, does it does it does it really ever set in? Does it really ever set in that we are the only only beings on Yahuwah's earth that has to pay to live here? Does that make any sense to anybody else? Hey, let me ask this. Where does the oil come from? Where does the energy come from? Where does the water come from? How do they sell it to you? I get it, folks, that this is uh, hard to digest. But the serpent, the serpent was the most subtle Subtle. Subtle. Do you know what that word means? Subtle? Everybody's looking for the guy to come in with the big horns on his head and with the pitchfork in it inside their church. No, that's not how he works. The subtleness of language and language manipulation is about is about as hidden as can be. It's about as sudden as can be. You think a word means something. It means something totally different. Hey, y'all using those dictionaries over here. We've got our own Admiralty Law, Black's Law Dictionary over here. And then we go, okay, my vote matters. I'm changing the world tomorrow with my vote. Huh. If we seek the truth, it will be revealed as enemies of the state. Reality doesn't care about your feelings, folks, nor any illusions you require to deal with that reality. The hardcore truth is that as as enemies of the state, and that's that's what you don't understand with the 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 trading with the enemy act of uh, 1917 actually deemed us enemies of the state. Now, let's let's do logical deduction because because Yahuwah gave us brains, right? Well, how can we prove that with our modern reality that we're enemies of this state? Come on. Anybody? Let's do... We got fluoride in our water. All right. We got poisons in our food. Hold on. Let, let's do this real quick. 
Only in the dumbed down states of America can you go inside a grocery store and they label something organic and sell it to you. All food's supposed to be what? Organic. Only here can they get away with something so just idiotic. The people even know that they're eating chemicals and plastics and pulp and everything else. And do they care? No, they don't care. The hardcore truth is that as enemies of state, in wartime, it is perfectly what? Legal. It's perfectly legal to burn up the state of California, to use geoengineering to flood out lands. It's perfectly okay to poison the children with vaccinations. It's perfectly okay to take your children and teach them there's 156 genders. It's perfectly okay to tell a, a man that he can be a woman. It's perfectly okay to kill the unborn. It's perfectly okay for every single one of these abominations. Why? Because legality doesn't equate to what? Morality. So they can poison our air, food, and water. Because what are we? Well, we're licensed. We'll see that again. Let's do that one more time. Let's do that one more time. This is Black's Law Dictionary. Y'all know what it is. A permission to break the law is granted by a belligerent state to its own subjects or to the subjects of the enemy to carry on trade interdicted by war. Let's read this together too while I'm on it. Let me do that. Let me find it. Where is it? I know I got it up here somewhere. Yeah. Such was the Roman Saturnalia, the favorite uh, popular recreation of paganism. And as the sports and games of the people outlast the date of their empires and are carried with them, however they may change their name and place on the globe, the grosser pleasures of the Saturnalia were too well adapted to their taste to be forgotten. The Saturnalia therefore long generated the most extraordinary institutions among the nations of modern Europe. And what seems more extraordinary than the unknown origin of the apparent absurdity itself, the Saturnalia crept into the services and offices of the Christian church. Strange it is to observe at the altar the rites of religion burlesque and all of its offices performed with the utmost buffoonery. It is only by tracing them to the Roman Saturnalia that we can account, uh, all account for these grotesque sports, the extraordinary mixture of libertinism and profaneness so long continued under Christianity. And of course, we would, we would know this if we knew uh, what Saturnalia celebrated as today. What Saturnalia were celebrated as today? They take the wood, uh, they take the wood, and they cut it from the axeman cut it from the forest and deck it with what? Gold and lights. Here's the main purpose, though: the extraordinary licenses of the Roman cult slaves and of the semi-serf population of nor northern Europe. Let's read this right here. The master allowed his slave. His few days of license. Well knowing that when they expired, they could be presumed upon no longer. The slave must be the slave. That's what license is. Grant you permission to do things. This is a Roman deal. I permit you, the master permits the slave to game with his master for three days during the Saturnalia Fest. Let's read another one. No contract is considered as valid as between enemies. At least so far as to give them a remedy in the courts of law of either government. And they have in the language of civil law no ability to sustain a persona stando in judicio. That means no personal standing in judicio court. You have no standing. The Agricultural Adjustment Act of May 12, 1933, Exhibit 43, to issue licenses, permitting processors, associations of producers and others to engage in the handling and the current of interstate or foreign commerce of any agricultural commodity or product thereof. 
Everything's been licensed. How do you know this? We, we know this because the root word for license is what? Licentious. That's where it comes from. Its root is, is licentious. Parting words of wisdom. Hey, look, folks, you know, the next few weeks uh, in the study group is going to focus on uh, the law. And um, as I get closer and closer, I will uh, let more and more men and women uh, know exactly how I do it. Uh, but here's the thing, folks. Even in this, this day that we live in, right, this hour that we live in, how come more men and women who actually come to the knowledge of the truth are we not able to actually do something for that truth? Probably fear. I said it last week. If Yahuwah can be for you, how, let's ask you, how many people actually believe this statement? If you, Yahuwah can be for you, who can be against you? If God can be for you, who can be against you? I'll tell you how many people believe it. Not, very, not enough to make a change. Data isn't information. Information isn't knowledge. Knowledge isn't wisdom. John 16, 23. And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask it. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. Hey man, look, we just got to get to this point, right? And I, I see it across the board in the, in the, you know, I've got a bunch of new subscribers on the YouTube channel and men and women, I uh, had five or six people ask me last week, why have I taken the word Lord out of my to uh, of vocabulary? Why? Lord means whatever it want, you want it to mean. Choy, you can say Lord means something totally different than when I say Lord. You can say God means something totally different than I say God. This is the importance of language. This is the subtleness in which the what? The serpent works. What you say in your own closet, in your inner chambers, within yourself, is your connection to the Most High, by the way. I don't judge anybody off that stuff, but this is the importance of words. Until we come to a recognition of how important our words are, we'll never get this stuff. I love you all and have a great day. If people just start, this is a kind of a sarcastic, tongue-in-cheek quote. If people would just start voting harder, things would get better. Maybe you need to vote twice every election. Four or five times. Six times. Ten times. Hey, look, you want to keep uh, voting for men to rule you? You're going to get it. You're going to get exactly what you, uh, what you asked for. Never mind the evidence to the contrary, folks. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for anointing me with this message. Let this seed fall on good ground. Open up the hearts and the minds of the people to accept this message. Let your word not return unto the void, but let it accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing where you sent it. In the precious Son's name we pray. All right, let's do that.